Think of a tropical jungle. Think of the trees. Think of the insects, the reptiles. Think of the fish in the river. Think of the birds. Think of the monkeys. This is one of the richest natural environments we can imagine. Then think of the countless numbers of single-celled organisms in the soil, on the skin of animals, on the leaves of trees. The, the sheer variety of life is staggering. The number of different species is staggering. Biologists really still don't know how many species there really are. In his book, Diversity of Life, E.O. Wilson writes, we don't know, not even to the nearest order of magnitude. The number of species could be close to 10 million, or it could be as high as 100 million. Of all these species, a little over 1 million have been listed and described. Of those, incidentally, about 750,000 are insects. So we haven't seriously begun to list the staggering variety of microorganisms uh, in amongst all of this. Yet all of these organisms, despite their variety, their differences in colour, shape, function, scale, share the DNA molecule. They share the same basic mechanisms of DNA and many of the same basic chemical processes. They, in fact, why not say it frankly, we are all relatives. We're all members of a single family. We're all part of the same family tree. And this is one of the fundamental payoffs to Darwin's idea. So, how did we get from the biological simplicity of the early Archean eon, about 3.8 billion years ago, when life first appeared, to the staggering variety of species that we find in later eons and later periods of, of history? That's the story I want to tell in this and the next lecture. In the last lecture, we described how we think life originated on Earth. Now, what I want to do is try to describe how life evolved to create the astonishing variety of forms present today. We've seen that this capacity to evolve, this capacity to adapt and create an astonishing number of different forms is itself one of the distinctive properties of life, one of the things that distinguishes life from non-life. So the variety of living organisms reflects, in a sense, a slow exploration by life as a whole. All the possible ways of getting energy from the environment, of all the possible niches that there are on Earth. We, of course, represent merely one of these many millions of species generated by this process over almost four billion years. But to understand how we were created, we need to understand the history of this long process of change. So we need to see how we fit in to the larger story of the evolution and proliferation of life on Earth. We're looking at the history of life on Earth. OK. We've seen that one of the things that Darwin did was to show that life is not static. It, too, has a history, like the universe, the stars and the Earth. And now we begin surveying that history. We'll see that the history of life begins with very, very simple life forms. We began to talk about them in the last lecture. But then, over almost four billion years, more and more new life forms appear. Until today, life looks very different from the life of the early Earth. I want to survey this history. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastically complex history. You could, you, could, you could devise an entire course about this history. So this is just a very, br very brief tour of this history. And I'm going to break it up into eight stages. Four I'll deal with today in this lecture and four in the next lecture. Each of these stages I have picked because they create one of the elements that would eventually define our own species. So this is a survey of the history of life on Earth, very much from a human perspective. If you want to get a sense of the chronology, you might find timelines two and three in the printed materials with this course are helpful. So in this lecture, I describe the first four of these stages in the evolution of life. This entire lecture is concerned with a period in the history of life on Earth when the only living living organisms on Earth were single-celled. And that period 
covers the first three billion years of the Earth's history. It covers most of the history of life on Earth. OK, the first stage. The first stage consists of the first organisms. We described in the last lecture, roughly speaking, how we think they were created. Almost certainly, if we'd been able to see them, we would describe them as prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are the simplest single-celled organisms we know on Earth today. Now, it's important to remind ourselves how important bacteria, single-celled organisms, are in the history of life on Earth. Life for the best part of three billion years of the Earth's history consisted of single-celled organisms. Not until about 600 million years ago would the first multi-celled organisms appear. Multi-celled organisms, therefore, have existed for only 15% of the time that life has flourished on Earth. They are an extremely recent development, and they represent, as we'll, say, we'll, as, as we'll see, a significant new level of complexity. One of the things this means is that if we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe, we should expect that most of the life we're going to find will take the form of something a bit like bacteria. It's going to be extremely simple. Prokaryotes. What are prokaryotes? They're very, very simple cells. Prokaryotes are, for the most part, invisible to the naked eye. Indeed, countless billions live in or on our bodies. They're so small that you could fit 100,000 prokaryotes into a single dot on a printed page. So they're absolutely minute. However, let me add, they are probably not quite the simplest of all organisms we know. We've seen that viruses seem to have evolved in the direction of greater simplicity. And as they, as they did so, they shed their capacity to generate energy on their own. They just abandoned their metabolism and they let other organisms do the work of metabolism, knowing that they could hijack that metabolic machinery whenever they wanted in order to maintain themselves. And, of course, we experience this hijacking and this sort of siphoning off of energy from our bodies, as well as the battle between the viruses and our, and our own cells every time we go down with flu. It's possible that viruses evolve from bacteria rather than the other way around, and if so, they represent an example of how evolution can lead not to greater complexity, but sometimes to greater simplicity as well. Back to prokaryotes. Like all cells, prokaryotes have a fatty membrane, a surface, which is semi-permeable. It can keep most of the important stuff inside, but it does allow chemicals to flow inwards for nutrition, and it allows waste products to flow outwards for excretion. So it's a sort of chemical bag that's not totally insulated from the outside, from the outside world. Within the cell, there are free-floating molecules of DNA. They just drift around in the centre of the cell. Now, inside the cells, what happens is RNA molecules... Now, I mentioned them in the last lecture. Remember, they are single-stranded equivalents of DNA, very closely related to DNA. Single-stranded molecules, these, these single-stranded molecules of RNA, approach... DNA, they peer inside it, prizing apart the double helix to get instructions for their next job inside the cell. So that's how the reproductive apparatus works. Prokaryotes, I've said, are extremely simple. And in a sense, that's true. By comparison with later organisms, it's going to be certainly very true. But by comparison with some of the earlier things we've seen in this course, even prokaryotes are immensely complex entities. To give you some sense of this, I'd like to quote once again from Bill Bryson's short history of almost everything. He offers a very entertaining description of what it might be like to be inside a cell. So here's Bill Bryson. Blown up to a scale at which atoms are about the size of peas, a cell itself, he writes, would be a sphere roughly half a mile across and supported by a complex framework of girders called the cytoskeleton. So you can imagine a sort of vast 
football stadium. Within it, millions upon millions of objects, some the size of basketballs, others the size of cars, would whiz about like bullets. There wouldn't be a place you could stand without being pummeled and ripped thousands of times every second from every direction. Even for its full-time occupants, the inside of a cell is a hazardous place. Each strand of DNA, he points out, is on average attacked or damaged once every 8.4 seconds, 10,000 times in a day, by chemicals and other agents that whack into or carelessly slice through it. And each of these wounds must be swiftly stitched up if the cell is not to perish. So I hope you're getting a sense of a, a cell as a very, very violent an active and complex place. The proteins are especially lively, spinning, pulsating and flying into each other up to a billion times a second. Enzymes, themselves a type of protein, dash everywhere, performing up to a thousand tasks a second. Like greatly speeded up worker ants, they busily build and rebuild molecules, hauling a piece off this one adding a piece to that one. Some monitor passing proteins and mark with a chemical those that are irreparably damaged or flawed. These chemicals are marked for execution. Once so selected, the doomed proteins proceed to a structure called a proteasome, where they are stripped down and their components used to build new proteins. Some types of protein exist for less than half an hour, others survive for weeks but all lead existences that are inconceivably frenzied. The earliest prokaryotes we know of probably got most of their food from chemicals near the seafloor. We've seen that life itself probably originated near uh, ocean floor volcanoes. And many, in fact, still survive by eating chemicals such as methane. We've seen that Mid-oceanic vents would have provided an ideal environment for the very earliest living organisms. They would have supplied energy, they would have been watery, they would have provided plenty of chemicals that bubbled up from the earth for the chemical reactions needed to create these early simple prokaryotes. And they also would have been protected from ultraviolet rays because they're deep beneath the sea. So, that's the first stage. Our earliest ancestors were almost certainly Simple prokaryotes probably live living deep in the sea. Stage two, photosynthesis. The second transition is the evolution of the complex chemical reaction known as photosynthesis. It's extremely complicated and it's now found in all plant or plant-like organisms. What photosynthesis does you, you can think of it as a sort of chemical trick or a, a piece of technology, if you like. It enables organisms to tap into an entirely new source of energy. And we saw that the very first living organisms are probably acquiring a lot of their energy or depending directly or indirectly on energy from the centre of the Earth. So the energy that fuels them is the heat at the centre of the Earth. What photosynthesis allows them to do is to tap into a much, much larger and more durable source of energy, the sun. So this means that by the time photosynthesis appeared, at least some prokaryotes had learned to live near the surface of the oceans, where they could feel the sun's energy and ingest its light. The ingredients needed for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water, those are the chemical ingredients, and the energy for the reaction comes from sunlight. The products of photosynthesis are first sugary molecules such as glucoses, which can act as stores of energy or batteries of energy. In effect, what they're doing is they're storing the energy of sunlight. But there's another byproduct, and that is oxygen. The manager of this entire process is the complex molecule we know as chlorophyll. When did the first photosynthesizing prokaryotes appear? They appeared almost certainly about 3.5 billion years ago.
Now, photosynthesis marks a fundamental threshold in the history of life on Earth because it enabled living organisms to tap into an entirely new energy source. It was a sort of energy bonanza. It's allowing them to tap into the energy flows generated in the core of the sun by hydrogen fusion. Today, all plants practice photosynthesis. They capture energy from the sun using green molecules of chlorophyll. And as plants are consumed by other organisms, this captured energy diffuses through the biosphere via the food chain. So note once again how powerfully the different stories of this course are linked. Through photosynthesis, the energy created in the center of a star, our sun, eventually flows to you and me. Now how do we know about the date of photosynthesis? Some of the oldest microfossils, these are microscopic fossils, they were only observed for the first time in the 20th century, are about 3.5 billion years, ago, years old. And they seem to be fossils of photosynthesizing algae, like modern cyanobacteria. Indeed, it's their discovery that provides the best evidence for the early appearance of photosynthesis, and indeed of life itself. These are the first clear fossils of life that we know. But their appearance suggests that something had existed even earlier. And that's why we assume that the very first prokaryotes appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. Now these cyan cyanobacteria-like bacteria, simple organisms, created coral-like structures called stromatolites. Stromatolites are huge crowds of organisms, and eventually as they die, these structures build and become larger and larger and larger. Some of them still exist today. They, they live and flourish, for example, off the western coast of Australia. But we have very ancient examples of them, so that we know the stromatolites are very, very old indeed. And if you want to imagine uh, an Archean landscape, if you want to imagine a sort of shallow seashore, you should probably imagine it's strewn with stromatolites. Photosynthesis produces oxygen, we've seen, as a byproduct. And that is exactly why free oxygen begins to build up in the Earth's atmosphere. By two and a half billion years ago, free oxygen starts building up, and we've seen the evidence for this in rusted bands of iron. So here's a second crucial piece of evidence for the appearance of photosynthesis, the appearance of these rusted bands. But the appearance of oxygen itself marks a very important stage in the history of life on Earth. For most prokaryotes, oxygen was poisonous. And we've seen essentially why. We've seen that oxygen is, is a viol violently reactive chemical. It likes nothing better than to get at simpler, fragile chemicals and break them up violently. And that's why Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan have described this change as the oxygen holocaust. As ox oxygen is building up, it's toxic for huge numbers of prokaryotes. And it probably killed off large numbers of them. This revolutionary change in the atmosphere provides one marker for the beginning of a new eon the Proterozoic Eon, from about 2.5 billion years ago. So that's our second stage. We've got the appearance of prokaryotes, which indirect evidence suggests occurred perhaps 3.8 billion years ago. And then we've got the appearance of this complex reaction of photosynthesis, which allowed living organisms to tap into the energy of the sun. And that seems to have appeared quite early perhaps 3.8, 3.5 billion years ago. And all in all, what this shows is that life appeared surprisingly rapidly on the Earth, almost as soon as it was possible. And that may mean that wherever the conditions for life are good, there's a reasonably good chance that life will appear. Stage three, eukaryotes. I've talked about prokaryotes, now we're talking about eukaryotes. EU K-A-R-Y-O-T-E-S. This is the third crucial transition in the era of single-celled organisms. We don't know exactly when eukaryotes appeared. It was probably sometime during the Proterozoic Eon, 
more than about one billion years ago. Most biologists would probably tell you today that this was one of the most revolutionary changes in the entire history of life. To a non-biologist, it doesn't necessarily appear terribly exciting, but most biologists regard the distinction between eukaryotes and prokaryotes as one of the most fundamental divisions of all between different types of living organisms. So this is important. And let me add immediately that we are constructed entirely of eukaryotes. So without this revolution, we would not have existed. Lynn Margulis, one of the most important biologists of the 20th century, she's been a, she has really pioneered work on study of what she called the microcosmos, the world of bacteria. And she's been very important in demonstrating how dangerous it is to neglect, to underestimate this world. She showed that eukaryotes evolved through the merging of once independent species of prokaryotes. Evidence for this is the presence, the fact that you can find in all eukaryotes internal organelles, as they're called. In our bodies, we have organs. Eukaryotes are more complex than prokaryotes in the sense that they have various different organelles inside. And some of those organelles have their own DNA. And that suggests that they had once existed quite independently. So somehow, two organisms have sort of merged to form eukaryotes. Now, eukaryotes, like prokaryotes, are single-celled organisms, but somehow other single cells have got inside them. How? It's not entirely clear. Perhaps they were eaten, but continued to survive, and began to find it rather cosy inside their new hosts. This, we'll see, is an example of a much more widespread phenomenon in the history of life, and that's symbiosis. Two species that don't compete to the death, but rather find advantageous ways of cooperating that help them both. These organelles include mitochondria. Mitochondria can extract energy from oxygen, and they have their own DNA. And chloroplasts, which can also extract it, which can extract energy from sunlight through photosynthesis. So all plant-like organisms have chloroplasts. Now, so it's these organelles that make it possible to claim that eukaryotes represent a significant increase in complexity. Here we have a structure that simply has more components, more bits and pieces than that of a prokaryote. But so does the fact that eukaryotes in turn will make possible the creation of new types of organisms that were even more complex than them. Because eventually we'll see that eukaryotes could assemble into larger organisms, but we'll come to that later. Now, the merging of these various organisms within eukaryotes through symbiosis anticipates the later creation of multicellular organisms. Eukaryotes are not quite multicellular, uh, but they're pointing in that direction. Most eukaryotes are much bigger than prokaryotes. They're about 10 to 1,000 times as large as prokaryotes, and some can just be seen with the naked eye. They're not only bigger, uh, they have a more elaborate reproductive ap apparatus in the sense that their DNA doesn't just float free inside the cell to be bombarded, as Bill Bryson described, by all the various things moving around inside the cell. The DNA of eukaryotes is protected within a special container, the nucleus. So this is one of the organelles. The cell has a nucleus in its center, which protects DNA. And that's important because it means the DNA can preserve its genetic code much more faithfully and reproduction can become more accurate. Now we've seen that many eukaryotic cells contain mitochondria, special organelles that once lived as independent organisms. What these can do is generate energy from oxygen. And oxygen provides a much more powerful source of energy than the types of metabolism used by most prokaryotes, such as fermentation. So eukaryotes flourished in an oxygen-rich atmosphere. And indeed, it's possible that their evolution was a response to the appearance of oxygen. So the appearance of eukaryotes marks a significant increase in the complexity of life.
Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan write, the difference between the new cells and the old prokaryotes in the fossil record looks as drastic as if the Wright Brothers Kitty Hawk flying machine had been followed a week later by the Concorde jet. So that's stage three, the appearance sometime in the Proterozoic Eon of eukaryotes. Stage four, sexual reproduction. This is the fourth crucial transition, the appearance of sexual reproduction, probably about one billion years ago. And it seems to be associated, in some sense, with the appearance of eukaryotes. Prokaryotes regularly exchange genetic material. This is a bit like the internet. They, it's as if they, they grab passing bits of genetic material that float in the environment. They use it and then pass it on. So prokaryotes live in a very different sort of reproductive world from us. But they normally reproduce simply by splitting into two identical individuals or clones. In most eukaryotes, reproduction takes a slightly different form. What happens is that two organisms, two eukaryotic cells, swap some genetic material before reproducing, and the offspring shares genetic material from both parents. It'll, it'll inherit a mixture of genetic material from the two parent individuals. I have to say, this, don't think this was necessarily fun sex. This wasn't necessarily very sexy at all. Um, the genetic aspects of sexuality emerged much earlier than the fun bits. Okay, why is this so important? Why is this swapping of genetic material before reproduction? It's important because it meant that the offspring of eukaryotic cells were no longer simply clones of their parents. Sexual reprodu reproduction introduces greater var variation between individuals. The offspring are never exactly the same as their parents. So you find that individuals start to vary from each other much more than in the prokaryotic world. Now we've seen already that natural selection sort of seizes on variations between individuals and that's what it builds on to eventually lead to change and to new species. So if you have a mechanism like sexual reproduction that generates more variety between individuals, you shouldn't be surprised if evolution speeds up. And that's, that seems to be exactly what happened during the last billion years. In effect, the emergence of sexual, sexual reproduction increased the efficiency of the mechanism of natural selection. As natural selection helps organisms sort of search constantly for new ways of exploiting the, national, the natural environment. So evolution speeds up. Let me summarize. In this lecture, I've surveyed the first three billion years of the history of life on Earth, beginning perhaps 3.8 billion years ago, ending about 600 million years ago. During that entire time, all organisms were single-celled. Now we go to the last 600 or so million years of the history of life on Earth. What happened then? We'll see the build-up of new structures that eventually would contribute to the emergence of our own species, human beings. Thank you. Think of a tropical jungle. Think of the trees. Think of the insects, the reptiles. Think of the fish in the river. Think of the birds. Think of the monkeys. This is one of the richest natural environments we can imagine. Then think of the countless numbers of single-celled organisms in the soil, on the skin of animals, on the leaves of trees. The, the sheer variety of life is staggering. The number of different species is staggering. Biologists really still don't know how many species there really are of life. One of the things that distinguishes life from non-life. So the variety of living organisms reflects, in a sense, a slow 
exploration by life as a whole, all the possible ways of getting energy from the environment, of all the possible niches that there are on Earth. We, of course, represent merely one of these many millions of species generated by this process over almost four billion years. But to understand how we were created, we need to understand the history of this long process of change. So we need to see how we fit in to the larger story of the evolution and proliferation of life on Earth. We're looking at the history of life on Earth. OK. We've seen that one of the things that Darwin did was to show that life is not static. It, too, has a history, like the universe, the stars and the Earth. And now we begin... In his book, Diversity of Life, E.O. Wilson writes, We don't know, not even to the nearest order of magnitude. The number of species could be close to 10 million, or it could be as high as 100 million. Of all these species, a little over 1 million have been listed and described. Of those, incidentally, about 750,000 are insects. So we haven't seriously begun to list the staggering variety of microorganisms uh, in amongst all of this. Yet all of these organisms, despite their variety, their differences in colour, shape, function, scale, share the DNA molecule. They share the same basic mechanisms of DNA and many of the same basic chemical processes. They, in fact, why not say it frankly, we, are all relatives. We're all members of a single family surveying that history. We'll see that the history of life begins with very, very simple life forms. We began to talk about them in the last lecture. But then, over almost four billion years, more and more new life forms appear. Until today, life looks very different from the life of the early Earth. I want to survey this history. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastically complex history. You could, you, could, you could devise an entire course about this history. So this is just a very, br very brief tour of this history. And I'm going to break it up into eight stages. Four I'll deal with today in this lecture and four in the next lecture. Each of these stages I have picked because they create one of the elements that would eventually define our own species. So this is a survey of the history of life on Earth, very much from a human perspective. If you want to get a sense of the chronology, you might find timelines two and family. We're all part of the same family tree. And this is one of the fundamental payoffs to Darwin's idea. So how did we get from the biological simplicity of the early Archean eon, about 3.8 billion years ago, when life first appeared, to the staggering variety of species that we find in later eons and later periods of, of history. That's the story I want to tell in this and the next lecture. In the last lecture, we described how we think life originated on Earth. Now, what I want to do is try to describe how life evolved to create the astonishing variety of forms present today. We've seen that this capacity to evolve, this capacity to adapt and create an astonishing number of different forms is itself one of the distinctive properties.